Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our official webinar on DEN surge protection devices. Uh, we're uh, very excited to host this webinar. It's, um, it's actually hosted by DEN. And um, we have uh, Alan, who is the DEN Key Account Manager, as well as Stefan, who is the DEN Electrical Engineer. And Stefan will be presenting the webinar this morning. The, the webinar will provide an overview on different types of surge arrestors in DEN, um, as well as why it is important to have surge protection, and also how to distinguish the different types of wave shapes you might find in surge arrestor. Uh, CFM will also be speaking about external lightning protection in industrial building, as well as manufacturing facilities. So uh, before I, I hand over to Stefan, I just wanted to run you through a, a brief overview in terms of the controls. So you will see at the your screen, there are a few toggles, there's a chat and a Q&A, as well as a raise your function. If you'd like to talk, please raise your hand. We will then open the floor so you're, you're able to physically talk. Please make use of the Q&A and the chat functions if you do have any questions throughout the course of the webinar. The just to hold all the questions until the end of the webinar, but if you do have any questions throughout the course of the webinar, please make use of the Q&A or the chat function. Do you have your catalog on hand? Um, if, if you want to refer to any part numbers or you want to chat to Alan and Stefan about any of the, um, the, the particular products that you may have a question on. And uh, there will also be a poll at the end of the webinar. Please assist us by completing the poll. It will take two minutes of your time. And the idea behind this is just to help us improve our, um, your experience on uh, the, the webinar. So that's, uh, that's it from me. And without further ado, I'd like to present Stefan. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us um, on this webinar today on surge protection devices. Um, as Karen mentioned, we're gonna discuss uh, the basics of surge protection devices and the different technologies then uh, incorporates with, with the surge protection devices. Um, yes, so without any further ado, uh, let's get started. So then is a German based a family owned company uh, active in more than 70 countries uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, we, are, um, we have more than 23 subsidiaries um, across the world. Um, also, we uh, are not only uh, manufacturers of surge protection devices, but we also have a manufacturer lighting, external lighting protection. That includes your air termination rods, your finials, and your earthing systems. So basically, DEN is not only a manufacturing company, we also have an engineering department where we do um, designs and risk assessments. We provide solutions for, for a lot of different industries. Um, as you can see from the image, we have, we have uh, different solutions for your wind energy sectors, your energy generation, which is more your PV systems, uh, protection for your cell sites, we have protection for communication systems, energy, dis energy distribution facilities, as well as your railway systems. So the requirements of an SPD. A SPD, as per standard IEC 62305, a resident needs to fulfill certain requirements. A search, a search protection device should um, be able to repeatedly discharge lightning currents without any destruction. SPD also should have a voltage protection level lower than the electric strength of your downstream electrical devices. And it should also be able to extinguish or limit the mains follow current from the supply system as not to damage your electrical systems downstream. The SPD is also, um, it's very important that the SPD should uh, coordinate with any downstream uh, surge protection devices that you, that you need to install. So the causes of transient overvoltages. This can be caused by a direct lightning strike to, for in, uh, to a building. With this, uh, a lightning waveform is associated by 10 stroke 350. What this means is that it takes 10 microseconds for the lightning current to reach peak value 
and 350 milliseconds to reduce to half of its peak value. Transients in your system can also be caused by an indirect lightning strike next to your building. Due to the high frequency behavior of a lightning strike, there's a changing magnetic field. If you have a changing magnetic field, you induce current and voltages onto nearby power or telecommunication lines. This is described by the inductive and capacitive coupling that a lightning strike has. Surges are generally defined as an H-20 waveform, which means that it takes eight microseconds for the current to reach its peak value and only 20 microseconds to reach half or to reduce the half of the maximum peak current. Another cause of uh, transient over voltages are your switching operations that could come from the utility um, when ESCOM does have load shedding, uh, switching off large um, inductive motors. You also uh, in, uh, get surges into your system with earth faults or short circuits within the network, and also tripping of fuses, as well as parallel installation of power and IT systems. As described earlier, a lightning waveform is described as a 10 strike 350, which is indicated by the red graph um, in, in the image, as well as your H strike 20, which is your surge current, shown in um, the green line on, on the graph. So this next slide will indicate to you what's the differences between these two graphs and why it's important to install the correct SPDs, uh, depending on uh, the expecting lightning current that you might expect. So from the test, we, we decided to do, uh, we choose the same current magnitude at 40 kA with a different type of um, uh, wave shape. So from this video, you can see that the first test was conducted by injecting a 40 kA peak lightning impulse to the system. You can see from the graph that nothing happened to the installation at H320. Now with the same current magnitude, injected with a 10 strike 350. So from this, you can see that, that depending on the wave shape of your um, current, the amount of energy transferred to your, to your electrical system with only a surge protection device An external lighting protection device is the amount of energy. This image shows some damages caused by lightning currents. As you can see that uh, a circuit board has been fried completely. Um, on the left hand side and on the right hand side, a cable was struck directly with a lightning strike and it actually damaged the whole cable, which needs now to be replaced. We've also seen damages in switch gear cabinets, uh, cabinets that did not have any surge protection devices. You can see that um, the lightning strike actually came into your electrical system and caused arcing, which caused the circuit or the switch gear cabinet to catch fire. Especially in our PV systems, uh, there's, there's a lot of damages associated with that um, on, due to your inverter. The inverter consists of very sensitive electronic devices which is subjected to a lot of transients um, over the course of operation. And if any, any of these transients are too high, it can cause damages. That's why it's important to also um, protect your inverters with surge protection devices. So the risks of a, of a lightning strike. All the systems are interconnected. You have your power facility, which then supplies power to your hospitals, your residential areas, or your urban areas. It supplies power to cell sites. It supplies power to, or it, it, it's connected to your renewable energy sectors, as well as your, your industrial facilities. So a lightning strike doesn't have to happen at your premises to cause damages. It can happen at any part of the electrical installation. And due to the connected nature of, of the electrical systems, the lightning current can come back onto the power lines into your buildings, and that's defined up to two kilometers away, that lightning can have an effect on your, 
on your system. Examples, examples of this is that you have a direct lightning strike. As you can see uh, from the residential area, you have your earthing system that's been fed by an underground power cable, which then goes to a transformer. And then you have your overhead connecting lines, connecting all the different parts of the networks together. So now one cause of, of lighting damage would be a direct strike to your building. The lighting current will flow to ground, uh, creating a, a voltage drop across the earthing system. Um, and also that same effect induces a current or voltage between your telecommunication and power lines. These voltages are usually in a, in a range of above a thousand volts, which is too high for your equipment to, to withstand. Another example of lighting damage is for your remote lighting strikes. First of all, if you get a direct lightning strike on an over uh, voltage line, uh, over volt, uh, high voltage line, that lighting current is now on your power cables going into the transformer and is conducted via the power cable into your um, residential area. Another cause of damages can be uh, surges uh, by cloud to cloud lightning strikes. Um, that, uh, magnetic if, uh, if, uh, that magnetic field associated with the lightning strike can cause transients on your overhead line systems, which is then connected via the electrical lines into your building, which can cause over voltages within your electrical installations. Another reason for damage is a lightning strike directly next to your residential area. Again, with the changing of magnetic field, you induces current and voltages onto your electrical system, which can cause damages. The standard IEC 6305 part four defines lighting protection levels. These levels are ranging from a level one, which is your highest lighting protection level to your level four, which is your lowest lighting protection level. These levels are determined by a risk assessment based on the building you're protecting. So the standard defines a, a lighting level one as a peak magnitude of 200 KA that you can expect um, on your electrical system, where your level four is 100 Ka of lightning current you can expect. To give you an example of this, let's say the external lighting protection system installed on your building with transformer, which is supply, and you also have a system installed on the roof. You have your 230 volt single phase uh, voltage coming into your building as well as your one ohm earthing resistance. So let's say you get a 100 Ka lightning strike to, to your lighting protection system. 100 Ka will flow down conductors to earth. Using Ohm's law, you can actually determine the voltage rise based on the current that's flowing in, into your earthing system and also the resistance of the earth grid. So you can expect 100 Ka to be present on your earth bar. This high, this high amount of, of potential difference um, between the 100 Ka that's now on your earth bar and that feeds into all your electrical equipment and your 230 volts electrical supply, and this high difference in voltages can cause flashovers or sparking. And that's bad for electrical installation, because what it is, does it, 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 it um, damages your electrical systems and also it gets a chance to, to actually start or create a fire condition. Another example um, of SPDs and how it's actually rated if you have your lightning strike to external lighting protection system, this is in this case a 200 K strike, which is your lightning level one. The general rule of thumb is that half of the lightning current will actually dissipate into ground. And another half, the other 50% will go back onto your earthing system. Now you need to install the correct type of SPDs to be capable of withstanding the 100 K A lightning protection or the 100 K A lightning current. This is done via 25 Ka arrestors, uh, which is 25 Ka rated per module. So the lighting current splits into four equal um, currents into your electrical system. 
This 25k A per line goes back to your transformer station and then goes to ground. The light protection zoning concept. So generally the lighting um, protection zoning concept is defined as you have a lighting, a a lighting protection level zero, which is on the outside of a building. And you have your lighting protection zone one, which is for example, inside your building. So the standard defines as you need to place surge protection devices or do eco potential bonding if you move between zones. So let's say you have your electrical power line that's that's for, uh, coming from outside into into your building. So this means that if you move across zones, you need to install a, 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 a surge protection device on the boundary of that level. You can see that the electrical power line, the antenna, the telecommunication lines are all bonded via a SPD. Other bonding measures are your masts or railings or any conductive. Um, any conductive uh, metal that, that, that's coming from outside the zone into your building also needs to be bonded just via an earthing connector. If you use the example of a double story house, you might have two distribution boards. Now, if you move across from a lighting level, um, a lighting protection zone one to a lighting protection zone two, you also need to install surge protection devices on the boundaries as well. This is where the energy coordination comes from because these two SPDs need to coordinate with each other. So how do we protect our systems? It's important to install surge protection devices on your power networks, as well as your data networks, because damages can come from, from both the power and data side um, or the data infrastructure. So our red line products, typically, uh, if you have a three-phase system, in South Africa, we use a TNCS system, which means that your earth and your neutral is separated at your main distribution board. We have different SPDs that, that's manufactured to, uh, to, to um, is manufactured to, to, based on the type of earthing system that you do have. So you can see from a three-phase supply, you have your, you have your type one surge protection device, installed in the main distribution board with then your type two surge protection devices installed further down in your electrical system. You can also have more fine protection. We have your type three surge protection devices installed, for instance, uh, in your plugs, et cetera. So basically, all the equipment that's that's installed within an electrical installation has a certain rated in, impulse withstand voltage. This is the voltage that's determined by the manufacturer itself. So these voltages um, are, are actually um, these these electrical installations are tested to withstand a, a certain amount of uh, with, uh, uh, impulse voltage. So what's important with an SPD is that you need to install an SPD that has a lower voltage protection level and what your equipment is rated for, which means that in a case where there's a fault event or a transient condition, the SPD will actually clamp your voltages at 1.5 kV in this example, which is below your rated withstand voltage, which means that then your system is safe. It's important in these types of installations to actually do energy coordination, where you have your type one and your type two combined surge protection device that's installed in your main service DB. Now there's different rules associated with uh, when to implement what SPD and where to install any additional type two surge protection devices. Now let's say you have your sub DB, uh, you can install a type two device because most of the lightning current has been dealt with with the type one, type two combined surge protection device. And if you would like, you can also install um, next to the terminal device as close as possible, another type two surge protection devices, as well as a type three surge protection device. So these graphs actually indicate nicely what happens with cascading of different types of surge protection devices, is that you can see that our type one, type two combined surge protection device can handle a 10 stroke 350 lightning uh, impulse waveform. So it means that that, that, that SPD installed um, in the main distribution board actually conducts most of the 
electrical or the electrical fault current from lightning into ground before it reaches um, your other type two surge protection devices. So type two surge protection device are capable of withstanding an H20 waveform, as well as a type three, sorry, a type three gets rid of all the small residential energy that's been left, that's been passed through the installation. But this is important to, to realize is that um, as you cascade surge protection devices, each protection device gets rid of most of the energy before passing it on to the next part of the installation. So at then, uh, we have our type one surge protection devices, as well as our type one and type two combined surge protection devices. Um, our type one SPDs or uh, combined surge protection devices will include our then ventil, as well as we have surge protection devices for, for, for different industries with different voltage levels, and also different voltage protection levels. These type one SPDs has a wave breaker function. What this means is that a type one SPD is actually the spark gaps are, are manufactured in a way that it takes care of most of the lightning current um, before it reaches another parts of your installation. We also have a type one surge protection device, which is our dense solid, which is installed specifically for your wind industry or wind turbines as well as our integrated surge protection devices, which has integrated backup fuses. We also have a type one and type two combined surge protection devices for your, for your DC applications, for instance, your PV industries. So the historical developments of our type one SPDs uh, started in 1984. As you can see from this is that how the surge protection devices has actually changed um, uh, changed over the years. You can see that the voltage protection levels with these older modules are still at 4 kV. And with the new technology we implemented today, um, the SPDs are now um, has a voltage level of, of 1.5 kV, which I explained earlier is better for electrical installations because it limits the voltage, um, it limits the voltage to below your electrical um, rated withstand voltages. And also with this, you can see that the, that the uh, a new spar gap technology has emerged, which is called your radex flow. So basically what the, the radex flow does is it is actually encapsulated spar gap. When a lightning current enters the spar gap, it passes through a gas emitting plastic. This gas emitting plastic releases a gas, which then extends the arc caused or created by the lightning current radially and axially uh, to extinguish the arc. The advantages of this is that it limits the high follow current uh, from your system. So in case where uh, this spark gap switches on, it creates, creates a, a momentarily a short circuit. And this new technology actually improves this. It lowers that short circuit current coming from from the source. Again, um, new technology that's coming out next year is that we have improved our spar gaps even further, which is now called the rapid arc control spar gap. It works with the arcing chamber with two electrodes. So arc actually forms between the two electrodes. It moves, moves up through the arcing chamber, uh, extinguishing the arc without any um, it is a residual energy passing through the spark gap going to your terminal device. And also a mention to mention that causes um, it has a low mains follow current, which means that any upstream fuses will be protected and will not um, chip in this case. So there's different types of technologies associated with search prediction devices. First of all, you get your varista type surge protection devices, which is called your voltage limiting surge protection devices. From the graph, you can see that a voltage limiting device actually limits the voltage to below a certain value. Where your spark gap switches the lightning current to ground, which can be been seen by this small peak on the red graph over here, and it reduces your, your residual voltage to nearly zero. But what we've done with our type one, type two combined SPDs, we actually 
included this in the same search protection device, which gives you best of both worlds. Now you have an SPD that's capable of withstanding a lightning current due to the spark gap technology, and also gives you that finer voltage protection level provided by the varistor. This is indicated in the graph as well. So you still have your switching spike, the triggering voltage for the spark gap, and then the MOV reduces the residual voltage to below a certain value. This is a, a test we have done in one of our laboratories in, in Germany. There is a comparison between coordination of the different types of, of components in surge protection devices. So first of all, uh, there was only a type one SPD based um, on a, a varista and a spa gap. They injected the, 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 the electrical circuit with a total of, of 1.25 kiloamps. And you can see that from this, the green graph, that's the total current that's flowing through your spark gap itself to ground. The red graph indicates the amount of current actually passing through to your terminal device. This is way too high for the electrical device to withstand. Now with the new technology, with the rapid arc control spark gap, you can see that from the same test, most of the current was actually directed via the SPD to ground and only a small amount of residual energy passed through to your terminal device. Refusing and fuse selection. Well, our SPDs, as a, if you go onto our website, as an as a installation manual, and depending on that application and the rating of your upstream circuit breaker, um, search arrestors in, in some applications might need to be prefused. Prefusing is required to protect the SPD itself from, completely, uh, from, from, from complete failure, as well as protecting your or disconnecting your molecular system when there's a fault occurring within an SPD. Now, prefusing is usually required for installations, for industrial installations with large um, AMP ratings. So you can see this is an example that's, that's been um, obtained from our website, the Den Ventil. On the right-hand side, there's, there's a graph or a table that indicates your, your F1, which is your upstream circuit breaker size, and F2 is the, uh, the, the selected fuse size that you would need to prefuse this arrestor with. So you can see from, depending on the upstream circuit breaker size, um, depending on the application, you need only need to prefuse your surge protection device when that rating becomes higher than 315 amps. You need, need to prefuse your surge protection device with a 315 GG fuse. As well as the, uh, depending on the rating of the upstream circuit breaker, you also need to, to install the correct um, cable size for, for the SPD as well. But to prefuse those protection devices um, uh, actually creates uh, less space in your distribution board because now you have to go buy uh, fuse holders and fuse um, and different fuses to actually just to prefuse your search protection devices. But we have created a solution for this, uh, which is called our Ben Ben CI. The CI technology stands for circuit interruption. This means that the DEN Ben CI has a built-in fuse inside this SPD itself. So this actually reduces the amount of space required for installation purposes, as well as it, it, it actually makes installation, installation much easier because now you don't need to go size fuses. Um, you just uh, install the module and you know you have um, the correct uh, fuse installed. It also reduces uh, cables now connecting your SPD, which is also very important um, with the functionality of, a, of an SPD. This is our DEN BNCI, which is, has the integrated backup fuse um, within the module itself. Some of our modules do have the FM contacts, which is a, a remote signaling contact, which you can wire um, any way we'd like, you can light a light, or you can, you can put a buzzer to know that the SPD has actually um, failed. Why well, it's important um, for the installations of SPDs, the cable links are also very important. Um, the general rule of thumb is that you need to keep your, your cable links as, as low as or short as possible. Connecting cables does have an impedance on that line, and the higher the impedance of that line becomes, 
the lower your voltage protection level um, or you actually degrade your SPD. That's why they always tell you, you need to install an SPD as close as possible to the terminal device. Because if there's a current flowing through this wire, there's a, there's a voltage drop across the cable, there's a residual voltage uh, drop across the surge protection device, and there's also then a voltage drop on your earthing conductor. So now if you start putting in longer connecting lines, you're actually derating the voltage protection level. So the voltage level that the SPD switches on becomes much higher. In, in cases, it can be higher than your electrical installation. The general rule of thumb is, is that the connecting cable lines, which is your, your line connecting from your bus port to your SPD, as well as from the SPD's earth terminal to your earth bar, should be lower than or shorter than one meter. Then moving over to our type two surge protection devices. So our type two surge protection devices are also manufactured for different types of industries. So you can see that you have your, your residential areas, you have your single pole surge protection devices, as well as your den cords, which can be installed in, in, in a plug uh, next to your uh, electrical equipment. We also have type two, two surge protection devices for your PV industry, as well as um, different type of, of type two surge protection devices um, based on, on the voltage level. So we do have a lot of different solutions for a lot of different applications. We also have moved from our type two surge protection devices, also had the CI technology integrated, but now we moved over to ACI, which is your advanced circuit interruption, which I will explain in the next few slides. Again, our first type two surge protection device, uh, which was Verista based, was manufactured in 1954. And throughout the years, these SPDs um, had new technologies integrated with it. Where in 2009, we launched our CI, uh, which was also nice because now you didn't have to worry about pre-fusing in the surge protection device. You know that it was actually taken care of. And now in 2019, we actually launched the ACI, which is your integrated switch bar gap combination. The advantages of this SPD is that it's that there is safe dimensioning associated with that. With that, that means that um, usually when selecting prefuses, you have to go check the upstream circuit breaker rating and you need to select a fuse based on that. And now you have to install the correct fuse for, for depending on the application. So the safe dimensioning actually takes care of that. It, you don't have to worry about any prefusing because prefusing with this arrestor is not required. Also, safe dimensioning, it's, uh, this SPD is only to be required to in, be installed with a six millimeter squared copper cable. There's no need to go check the installation instructions to see, depending on the type of installation and the upstream circuit breaker, you don't need to size cables. So it makes installation much easier and also cheaper. It also has a temporary over voltage with stand capabilities. Um, of the MOV, as you can see from the diagram on the right hand side, this uh, new switch bar gap technology, it's actually an open circuit. Only during fault conditions, it actually um, connects and then the SPD or the MOV is connected into your system. So when you have an over voltage, the, SPD, the MOV isn't actually connected to your system, which is then um, uh, extending the lifetime of, of the MOV as well. And also with the, with the new spar gap or switch spar gap technology, you have a small lay through energy. Um, so when most of the, the, the energy of, of, of a fault condition will actually go to ground via the SPD and not a lot of energy will actually go through or pass through to your downstream electrical installations. Another feature for this SPD is that it has a zero leakage current. Usually with, with MOVs, it degrades over time and it starts leaking current, um, which can cause nuisance, nuisance tripping. Now, this is actually dealt with due to this disconnecting element at the top, um, which is in, in normal operation open circuit. So your MOV isn't subjected to any voltage stresses over the course of, of its lifetime. That's why um, there's zero leakage currents um, from this device. And another nice um, feature of this uh, SPD is that you don't need, if you do insta insulation testing, uh, 
uh, with the installation. You don't need to remove the modules. Um, you know, you, you, you can protect, you can actually do the testing without removing the modules, um, which is much, much easier. So we have a video that actually um, shows how the ACI technology actually works during a fault condition. So our ACI then guard is our type two search protection device. And as I mentioned, um, the new, the new spark gap or switch spark gap technology provides safe dimensioning, gives you a higher temporary over voltage withstand capabilities, as well as there's a small lead through energy going through your uh, downstream electrical devices. So this is how the SPD is made up of. If there's a H220 coming into the SPD, an arc is generated. That arc moves through the as, as new fancy um, uh, arcing chambers and it extinguishes the arc um, and directs the, the, the energy to ground. In case of a fault condition, uh, you have a short circuit. It actually can interrupt the short circuit and disconnect the SPD when it's overstressed. The safe dimensioning is, is also um, nice with this uh, implementation of the SPD is because it removes the, the requirement of any external backup fuses. So all the connecting links or wires can be kept as short as possible. So the way not having uh, to install fuses actually uh, lowers your, your amount of cable that, that is required for this new ACI technology. Next year, ACI is only now available with our type two search protection devices, but um, from next year, our Denning Teal ACI is going to be released, which is your type one search protection device. Just to run over uh, the features again of the ACI, you can see that it provides safe dimensioning. Um, six millimeter squared cables are, are always sufficient, independent of the upstream circuit breaker size. Uh, also with this is you have a longer um, lifetime of the, of, of the MOV and also it provides you a higher uh, withstand voltages. As well, it's same as the other SPDs, it has a overcurrent protection, which actually disconnects the SPD uh, in, in overstressed conditions. And also this technology provides that you have more space in your switch gear cabinets um, and you don't need to install any backup fuses and also it gives you a type two protection. This is our three phase module. We also have the ACI technology for our three phases. Um, and this, uh, depending on the earthing configuration um, that you have, uh, there's different uh, SPDs based on or different part numbers based on the earthing configuration. The ratings are also given on the website. So you can see that um, the short circuit capabilities of this SPD is at 25 kA. It can do a, max, a, a nominal um, a current of 20 kA H220, and uh, its operating voltage is also shown. So you can choose the uh, correct SPD depending on the voltage levels. All of our SPDs comes with this dynamic uh, thermal disconnect um, flag, which shows when an SPD has failed. Um, which is nice of this is that you can actually see uh, mechanically that the assert protection device has actually has to be removed when the flag turns red. And um, with our new modular type of SPDs, you can only you can just remove the module and replace it with a new one. As well as if you have industrial applications, you can wire a, a remote signaling contact connection, depending on your logic that you want to use. You can wire a signal to be sent to someone that the SPD has actually failed and that it needs to be uh, replaced. So, moving over to our yellow line products. Same with our power systems. We have um, different applications for your telecommunication industry as well. Uh, you can see that that from um, our, our measuring systems, you have your dent pipes, um, you have your blitz ductic connects, which we will explain a little bit later on. Uh, we have we have the same SPD uh, manufactured as well uh, uh, for your EX explosive areas. 
Um, you also have your, your, your dent patch outdoor, which, is, which can be installed outside to, to um, protect you against any, for all your ethernet applications. You have your den, den rapid LSA, your den patch, which is your, for your ethernet applications, as well as your bus detector, which is for your KNX um, systems. The same with your data networks, uh, your ethernet applications, we have the den patch and a den patch outdoor. Moving over to your telecommunication uh, products, we have the Blitz Doctor and the Blitz Doctor Connect, which can be used to, to protect your telef um, telephone systems, as well as the Den Rapid LSA, which is, which is uh, all the um, uh, technology. The same for your uh, coaxial um, antenna technology. Uh, you have, uh, we have search protection devices protecting the systems as well. So you have your Den Gate, uh, which can be used to protect um, your coaxial systems and your antennas. Um, and there's different um, modules and types of SPDs based on, on the protection that you, that you need. So one very important thing with, with um, the difference between communication SPDs and our power SPDs is that the SPDs for, which is used in telecommunication systems are actually installed in series. Our power system installations are done in parallel. So installation for your telecommunication is very important. Important uh, as to keep your protect should be installed as far away as possible um, from your from your protected side. Uh, you shouldn't loop the conductors next to each other because if a fault current or fault events happens to come onto one of these lines, the, the inducing effect will actually create a fault condition or a transient over voltage on the other side of the SPD. So you're in, a, in a, essence actually bypassing the whole protection of this SPD. To give you an example of a typical installation, now you have your, 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 your blitz ductus installed in a cabinet. Now you, uh, you wide your, your, your insides, which is your, your protected or unprotected sides uh, with your, with your uh, protected sides together. Now with this, it causes into induction loops. So the, the fault current actually um, goes onto your, your clean ends to your terminal device. The correct way of installing this is actually to, to install all the cables, or all the clean sides next to each other. So there's different ways of actually um, protect if, if communication SPDs are actually damaged. Uh, we have two different types of bases uh, which we use. Uh, normally, it's uh, we have a, a, a base that's that's normally open, and then we also have a base that's normally closed. So depending on the installation, if it's very critical, customers of, often tend to to have a base that's normally uh, open. So when you remove your protection module the signal is actually be disconnected. They like it in the applications because if there's no search protection device installed, the SPD or the line is, is not subjected to any transient conditions. But in cases, um, it's required that, that the signal should continue if the module has been removed. In that case, the normally closed um, base is, is, is uh, installed. Yes. So earthing also through this is done through, through um, the, the, the DIN rail um, as well. So there's no additional need for earthing cables for this SPD. Some of our SPDs has this life check function, um, which works with an RFID chip. You can, you can actually uh, check if the SPD has failed or not. And this is also maintenance free. This is a very nice way with, with our DEN record, which I'll show later how to check if this SPD is actually still functional or not. So this uses a RFID chip, which is installed in the module. And with our DEN record, you can actually monitor uh, to check if the SPD is actually um, is still functional or not. The test is quite, quite easy. You have a pass and fail light 
uh, you, you connect the, the, the protection module as it is in the image and you press test and depending on the information received from the RFID chip, um, you can see if the SPD has actually failed um, or not. We also have a much more fancier um, then record uh, device, which can tell you um, that the SPD is okay and um, you might need to consider it uh, later on. It gives you ex ex expected um, lifetime of an SPD. And this is nice, this um, then record is because you don't have to do any maintenance on it. It's very easy to, to actually test the functionality of the SPD um, as well as uh, it's, it's a galvanically isolated measurement. So there's no need to disconnect any wires for, for actually testing the, the SPD. So our blitz doctor product history actually started in 1979 with the first blitz doctor um, and throughout the years it actually evolved and became uh, much smaller. And in 2006, we, we launched the Blitz Doctor XT. And now in 2020, we actually released the new Blitz Doctor Connect. Um, These features are going to explain also in, in the later slides. Okay, so first of all, um, uh, from the image, you can see that the Blitz Doctor Connect is much smaller. It's about half the size of the, uh, of the normal Blitz Doctor. Uh, which, which uh, actually increases the space um, in your distribution board or your cabinet. Also, they, they, they changed the design a bit now with uh, 45 degree um, um, pushing terminals. Also, a nice function of this is that you have a wire push button which actually opens contacts. So you don't, know, you don't need any installation tools to install this SPD. It has a test port where with certain measurements, you can actually test the base and the module to see if it's actually still functional. You also have a, 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 a reverse polarity protection module uh, base that prevents you from actually putting in the SPD the wrong way. And also, um, same as our power SPDs, it has an overload fault mode. In a case where the SPD is overloaded, it actually mechanically disconnects the SPD from your system. Also implemented in this SPD, it also has a life check monitoring system that can be installed with the use of this Blitz Doctor Connects. Um, and also you can see that from, from the window, you can actually, you can check if the SPD is still functional or not. With new clips installed, which we call the secure release, um, the modules, because it's small, it's easier, it's actually easy if it's installed next to each other to actually remove the wrong module. But now they included this uh, new secure release technology, which actually it's clips that you can clip open before removing the module. And the same as with the previous one, everything is done via the, the thin rail. So if you have an installation of a lot of these Blitz Doctor Connects, uh, installed, you can actually implement a monitoring system which does active monitoring. So you supply it with an external uh, uh, voltage uh, or power source. And this works through actually determining which SPD has failed. So how this works it is it works with a transmitter and a receiver. So two bases or, or signaling contacts are placed on either ends and it uses an infrared light to measure the, the system. Now, if a flag has uh, SPD has thermally overloaded, it actually closes the flag and it closes this, the, the part where the signal passes. So now no signal can actually go through to your SPD. This shows or indicates that the SPD has failed and you need to replace. That's very nice for this because if you have large industrial applications, it's not always feasible to go through your installation um, every day to check your SPD has failed. You can use this new signaling remote contacts um, to actually monitor your systems and to see which SPDs needs to be replaced. Okay, so thanks. Um, this uh, concludes the presentation um, of our SPDs and our, as well as for power and yellow line. Um, and thanks for, for, for your attention.
Okay, great. Thanks so much, Stefan. Thanks, Alan. Um, I think this has been a very informative webinar. Just to let everybody know, the webinar recording will be emailed through to you in the next 48 hours. So uh, again, thank you so much, Den, for all the, the informative information. I'm going to launch the poll now. If you wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes of your time just to answer a couple of questions related to the webinar. If you do have any questions, please, you, if you have a look on the chat function, you can see Stefan's email address is there. You're welcome to email him directly or send any queries through to info at EM and we will attend to them as soon as possible. But on the whole, thanks very much, Jen, and um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much.